Get 12 weeks of The Spectator in print and online for just £12. And we'll give you a £20 Amazon gift voucher absolutely free. Go to spectator.co.uk forward slash voucher. Hello and welcome to Spectator Out Loud, where each week we ask three of our writers to read their pieces out. We've got Douglas Murray, who argues that nothing is racist if everything is racist, the Reverend Steve Morris and why we should bring back the British holiday camp, and Toby Young on his new dating website for lockdown sceptics. First, Douglas Murray. Hearing that Dawn Butler MP had been pulled over by the Metropolitan Police, I briefly hoped the taxpayer might get back the Whirlpool bath she charged us on her parliamentary expenses. But the officers skipped the boot and went straight to the passenger side, where they found the member for Brent Central recording them with her phone and looking pleased as punch to audition as the new Rosa Parks. As it happens, the footage she released showed the police being deeply polite and they subsequently explained that the pullover had been due to a registration plate mix-up. But Butler claimed it was a case of the dreaded stop and search and within hours she was on Channel 4 News being grilled by one of their crack interviewers. Fatima Manji asked Butler how such a thing could happen to someone who a day earlier had been declared one of the 25 most inspirational women in Britain by Vogue magazine. The questions on Channel 4 News seem to have got easier since I last went on. A smiling butler explained that this was all par for the course for an African-Caribbean woman. She then claimed that the Met Police is institutionally racist and that Cressida Dick should spend all of her waking moments trying to eradicate institutionally racism from the Met Police. A day earlier, a black teenager had been macheted to death in broad daylight in front of shoppers on London's Oxford Street. Three men, aged 18, were arrested after arriving at hospital with stab wounds of their own. What normally happens at this stage is that politicians and pundits debate the utility of stop and search. Some people say that stop and search saves young black lives. Others, like Dawn Butler, declare that stop and search is racist because it disproportionately targets people of the racial background who disproportionately do the stabbing. Then the stabbing continues. I don't mind admitting that I am growing tired of all the allegations. When Butler tagged the Met Police as institutionally racist, I noticed myself, for the first time, vaguely shrugging. Not because actual racism isn't a horrible and ugly thing, but because the currency appears to have been inflated out of use. Over recent months, absolutely everything has been declared racist. Our entire history, our whole society and every white person in it. So allegations about the Met have lost the piquancy they once had. Meanwhile, news of just how racist and awful the UK is appears not to have spread across the Channel. Between Thursday and Sunday, 700 illegal migrants arrived in the UK by boat, largely courtesy of the UK Border Force. The authorities help the people smuggling networks by meeting the migrants a little way out in the Channel, assisting them off their flimsy vessels and depositing them safely on British soil, where they can recover from the ordeal that is France. Like the debate over stop and search, the discussion of what to do about law-breaking on this scale is hobbled at the start, because unless you say, let in these tired and huddled masses, then you will be accused of racism. Ponder out loud whether everyone from the developing world who wishes to move to the developed world is absolutely the same as a Jew fleeing Nazi Germany, and you will be accused of this same appalling vice. As it happens, 
a certain amount of vice, or at least vice signalling, is good for stopping illegal migration. When faced with a surge in illegal migration earlier this decade, the Australian government let it be known that anyone trying to break into the country would see their boat repelled and spend months on a lonely island. While the international media decried this decision, attempts to break into Australia dried up. Similarly, in 2016, the Danish parliament voted in a law that made it possible to take valuables from an illegal migrant up to the amount that their stay would cost the Danish taxpayer. There were howls from the foreign media, and while I don't know of even one case where the law was enacted, it proved very helpful in sending a message. In recent days, some Tories who wanted to sound tough have talked of sending in the Royal Navy, but on current performance, that will simply allow more British vessels to pick up more migrants. Of the thousands who have broken into Britain already this year, all are put up in hotels and other accommodation at taxpayers' expense, and no one, not one, has been returned. Of course, at this stage, people tend to bow to the magisterium of the law. But immigration law has become a charade. By law, none of the recent arrivals should be here. According to the Dublin regulation, genuine asylum seekers ought to have claimed asylum in the first safe country they entered. By rights, every arrival should be returned to France who should then return them to Italy, or whichever country they came in from, who should return them to the country in which they started. None of which happens. It is a pretense, happily nodded along to by people who think they can afford it. We have an asylum system, which the British public actually support. But we also now have this strange bonus system where, so long as you complete the assault course and make it to Kent, or the sea near it, then you're in. The only way to stop the crossings would be to let it be known that everyone who tries to enter this country illegally will be returned, having risked their lives and wasted their savings. But no politician will suggest it, for the same reason that they fear discussing stop and search and other policies. Because to do so risks accusations of racism from insincere actors. Personally, I start to feel myself getting past all this. When everything has become racist, then nothing is. And the government should ignore the critics and just do whatever will stop the law-breaking, on land or sea. That was Douglas Murray, now Reverend Steve Morris. By the 1980s, after decades of immense popularity, the great British holiday camp was in terminal decline. The huge camps founded by Billy Butlin and Fred Pontin, the chalets, the dining hall, the redcoats in Butlins, and bluecoats Pontins, were becoming passé, now the few that remain have been rebranded as holiday villages. But why not bring them back? Surely old-fashioned camps had exactly what we need today. Simplicity, gentle fun and a sense of community. They were about team effort, not atomised nuclear families. Above all, perhaps, they had a sense of identity. And they were a real life changer for me. I recently came across an online video of Gunton Hall near Lowestoft in the late 1970s. The film, all 19 minutes of it, was sheer time travel because there on the screen, along with hundreds of other campers, were my brother, my dad and me. Also recorded for posterity were the canoe races. No life jackets, only rickety vessels on a deep lake. The donkey derbies, with more hair-raising spills than the Grand National. And the archery, without adult supervision. It's a wonder that we all survived without serious injury, but we did. Possibly because we'd learned to watch out for ourselves. There was a structure to a week in the camp. It wasn't simply about lazing around. When people arrived, they'd be split into two houses, and for the rest of the week, dozens of activities 
helped gain points for your house. These were done as a family, with no individual prizes. After months locked up in our homes, don't we yearn for a sense of shared endeavour again? For my parents, the experience was bittersweet. My dad had lost a very good job, so the overseas holidays went, together with the nice car and sharp suits. We swapped five-star accommodation for lower stuffed by the sea. But I preferred the camp. It shaped who I am now. Holiday camps encourage life skills. My time in the Donkey Derby built up not just riding abilities, but resilience. I spent more time falling off the thing than I did on it. But as a result, I went on to develop a lifelong love of horses. What's more, there was betting on the outcome. My father and I spotted one particular donkey that always won. Despite the organisers changing his number and bib for every race, we recognised his markings and made a decent return on our investment. I grasped the importance of paying attention and taking your chances. I think we all knew that we'd always have to make our own luck. We also had cricket coaching from a wonderful old gentleman called Harry, who stayed at the camp. Each day I would be in the nets, brushing up on my forward defences and learning how to bowl. I got over my fear of the cricket ball at Gunton, and that was useful too. However hard the projectiles life throws at you, there's always a way of avoiding them. Every evening a band performed. Sometimes we were offered the chance to get up and sing a kind of early karaoke. This is why, later in life, before I became a vicar, I spent years trying to be a pop star. Plus, one night, the main turn was the marvellous Burt Whedon, author of the guitar tutorial guides Play in a Day, which influenced the likes of Paul McCartney, Eric Clapton and Brian May. I remember listening to Burt and his beautiful guitar sound and speaking to him afterwards. His advice was never to give up and to keep practising. One night, a very ancient Tommy Trinder did the cabaret. The ballroom was packed. I think everyone knew Trinder was well past his best. I began to doubt he'd still be breathing at the end, but there he was, wearing that old battered hat and whispering his catchphrase, You lucky people. We gave him a standing ovation. Trinder was one of us, and we weren't going to make him feel bad. I learned something about grace that has helped in my vocation as a vicar. By the time I started going to holiday camps with my wounded and financially insecure family, such places were as much past their prime as Tommy Trinder, and the UK of the time was a very uncertain place. Nevertheless, Lowestoft taught me that it's possible to have a good time even when it rains, and odd as it sounds in this leisure-obsessed era, that a holiday with a shared sense of purpose, with activities and community, can be more relaxing than merely hanging out by a pool. The campaign for the rebirth of the holiday camp starts here. That was Steve Morris and finally Toby Young. I started a dating site last Sunday. Not words I ever thought I'd write, but I've become a kind of den mother to a large group of people who believe the risk of coronavirus has been exaggerated, and it dawned on me that this could be a useful service for them. The idea is that if you're a Covid realist, you don't want to go out with a hysteric who thinks the lockdown is being eased too quickly and frets about a second wave. You probably wouldn't even be able to arrange a first date, let alone manage a kiss at the end of the evening. What you need is a safe space where you can meet potential partners who share similar views. It all began in April when I started a blog called Lockdown Skeptics. I wanted to create a clubhouse for that small band of dissenters who think that locking down the entire population, the healthy as well as the sick, is a violation of our civil liberties, particularly when our scientific understanding of how the virus is transmitted is so incomplete. 
It quickly started getting a lot of traffic, suggesting we aren't such a tiny minority after all. On an average day, the site gets 25,000 visitors, and to date, it's had more than 2.5 million page views. Last week, I got an email from one of my regular correspondents saying he was newly divorced and thinking of signing up with a dating agency. Quote, It made me realise that a key criterion for meeting someone is that they absolutely must be a lockdown sceptic, he wrote. I genuinely think that if I can find a girl as sceptical as me, she must therefore be marriage material. That's how important, and sadly divisive, this issue has now become. I could never date, let alone build a relationship with, a lockdown zealot, unquote. That's when the light bulb appeared above my head. Why not start a dating site myself? My tech-savvy collaborator, Ian Rons, had already created some discussion forums on the website, so all he needed to do was add a new page where users could post their Lonely Hearts messages. We decided to call it Love in a Covid Climate. Almost as soon as it was launched, it was invaded by pro-lockdown trolls who think anyone who downplays the threat of the virus is a middle-aged, Brexit-supporting, Tory-voting, scientifically illiterate 5G conspiracy theorist. They began to post satirical personal ads, some of which, I have to admit, were quite funny. Quote, After a demoralising divorce, I was, like many, reinvigorated by the Brexit movement, only to be let down by Boris in this mask debacle, wrote one. Looking for Albion-loving lady, 35 to 50, who would be open to dressing up as Winston Churchill and spanking me with a cricket bat while I sing Land of Hope and Glory. No snowflakes need apply, unquote. Other wags suggested alternative names for the new service, including Two Meters, OK Stupid and Spreader. The general theme was that lockdown sceptics are more likely to have the virus than other people, making them extremely unappealing as dating prospects. I even got an email from a journalist at The Guardian asking me to respond to the charge that the forum could spread coronavirus and harm the individuals involved. But as we sceptics are fond of pointing out, almost no one has the virus anymore. Many people wildly exaggerate the risk. For instance, a poll published a couple of weeks ago found that the public believe that 7% of the UK population has died of COVID-19. That's more than 4.5 million people. In fact, the real number of COVID fatalities in Britain is about 45,000, 1% of that. According to John Ioannidis, a Stanford professor of medicine, you're more likely to die in a road traffic accident than you are of the virus if you're under 65. As I told The Guardian reporter, I've created my dating site for people who are properly informed about the risk and want to meet others who haven't succumbed to what Bernard Henry Levy calls psychotic delirium. Luckily, Ian Rons had already put a team of moderators in place to keep the forums clean and tidy, and they quickly went to work, kicking out the trolls. Since then, I'm happy to report, it's really taken off, with dozens of legitimate users now posting bona fide messages. I have no doubt that within six months we'll be celebrating our first Lockdown Skeptics wedding. That was Toby Young and that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed it and please send any feedback to podcast at spectator.co.uk. We always love hearing from our listeners and if you've got any thoughts at all on our podcast, please do send them in. Thank you and thanks to our producers and to you. <laughs>